Hey guys, Tisha here, and we are back for another chapter read of Love Times 3. Let me apologize in advance for the sounds that you may hear. It is currently 65 degrees where I'm at, and the people are outside, and the children are in the hall. So you may hear various noises outside of my patio door or in the hallway and all those things, and I am sorry, but I wanted to make sure that I got this out here because it's time for another chapter read. So this is entitled Going Public. In spite of the problems they face, some of these new forms of close relationships, including plural families among contemporary Mormon fundamentalists, are here to stay in American and Western society. They are not likely to go away. They are not fads or fancies. They are not aberrations. They will be part of the family life scene well into the future. We must therefore learn about them, learn from them, and even help people live the lifestyle of their choice. This is from Erwin Altman and Joseph, researchers and authors of Polygamous Families in Contemporary Societies. Thou. In 2006, polygamy was a hot news topic as FLDS leader Warren Jeffs made the FBI's most wanted list of fugitives. I feel like... If we don't know any other name, we know that name of Warren Jeff. Sorry, y'all. This is super crooked and it's going to drive me nuts. And yes, I just did all that on screen, but it's just, just going to drive me nuts. It's still crooked. <laughs> I guess it's going to be crooked. Let me not look at the screen. <laughs> As I was saying, if we don't know any other name, we know the name of Warren Jeffs. He was arrested that August during a traffic stop in Nevada, triggering a massive amount of media coverage. But there was little effort to clarify that the LLDS do not represent all fundamentalist Mormons. It seemed all the educational efforts we'd undertaken in recent years had achieved nothing, which was hard to take because it hadn't been easy to be more public about our lives. In fact, when we were first asked to be on the cover of Mormon Focus, we were filled with terror about the possible consequences. Posing for that 2003 cover was bittersweet experience. That's part of the reason why a lot of times they say that this family is kind of what expired um, Big Love, even though a lot of what we've seen on Big Love, they said did not happen in their family. Big Love used this family for their inspiration. Vicky and I held our youngest daughters, but Alina's arms were empty. Kyra, or Kira, y'all, because I'm still not sure how to say um, their daughter, that past name, was on each of our minds that day. In the years that followed publication of the magazine, we'd done a handful of media interviews. Despite our familiarity with the process, the avalanche of interest in polygamy after Warren Jeff's arrest was intense. National media from CNN to NBC's Nightly News reached out through Principal Voices with the same request. Now, Principal Voices is the same group that Christine used to work with, which is part of the reason why they gained interest in the Browns because of their interactions with Christine. Can you get us a family to interview? Can you get us a family to interview? Back then, the FLDS were notoriously averse to media, as were most plural families. Once again, we decided to step forward, even though every request brought a new round of anxiety and soul searching about whether to further expose ourselves publicly. We accepted interview requests from reporters and college students around the world who wanted to know more about our lifestyle and why we chose to live this way. We also gave numerous presentations to college classes, at conferences for social workers, child abuse experts, attorneys, and law enforcement officers. So we've been told that one of the main reasons why Cody wanted to go public was because they wanted to educate people. These people, this family actually had their boots on the ground and were doing that in other ways. And yes, Christine was doing it too, but the whole family wasn't doing it. Um, but this family was doing it in other ways through so many other means. For the most part, Joyce, uh, Joe stayed in the shadows while Alina, Vicky, and I took turns sharing our view of the plural life. 
Typically, we were identified only by our first names. Nonetheless, the criminal status of our lifestyle in Utah, polygamy, falls under the bigamy statute and is a third degree felon, made us cautious in our answers to certain questions. Before the second season of Big Love, the show reached out to the polygamous culture and Vicky and I were among a handful of plural wives interviewed for a promotional documentary that launched the new season. My interview captured the hesitancy most polygamists feel when asked for personal information. A producer asked me what Joe's do, what Joe does for a living. Um, uh, he manages, I stuttered. So he's a professional, the producer asked. Uh, uh-huh, I said. So you're being discreet with me? I am. I don't want him to lose his job, I said. I wasn't exaggerating. Joe's boss, who knew about our family, had explicitly told him to avoid being public. One major client had stopped doing business with Joe after a competitor emailed him to link to emailed him the link to an interview Joe gave on CNN in 2006, even though Joe was shown in silhouette and did not identify himself by name. I feel like that's really cruel for you to go as far as to prevent someone from um, obtaining finances, for you to go as far as possibly having them lose their job because you don't believe in their belief system, that's a bit much. Now, had this been one of the, the um, Warren Jeffs of the world, then knock yourself out. But just because he did that interview, he didn't say anything that would alarm you like how we've been alarmed by the clips that we've seen of Warren Jeffs. That had chilled Joe's participation, even in a limited way, in interviews, but we carried on. One of my favorite experiences came in 2007, in seven, oh my goodness. <laughs> I promise you I know my numbers. <laughs> in 2007, when Oprah said she had an aha moment when I appeared on her show to talk about my family. I heard your point. I really heard that when you said we live in a country with so many alternative lifestyles and you're saying I want the right to be able to not be considered a criminal if I choose to live this way, Oprah said on air. Not only were, uh, was she on Oprah, but the whole family was on Dr. Phil and Lisa. Hey, Lisa girl. <laughs> Lisa had pointed it out to me in the comment section that she had seen them on Dr. Phil. So I went ahead and I looked at an old interview and I said, okay, this family really was out there and they really were doing things. And even on that Dr. Phil video, despite some of the negative commentary that I saw, it seems like they changed some people's minds based on the things that they were saying and what they observed. Um, check it out if you can. If I remember to, I'll link it in the um, the video. Then, as we said goodbye, Oprah added, you have shed a different light on it. Just looking at you has been eye-opening experience for me. To hear Oprah, Oprah say that was really rewarding because changing perspectives is what we're all about. Why we put our family at risk for persecution when we go into public this way. I knew that page was attached. <laughs> I was on the TV show Larry King Live the next year in April 2008 and then CNN talk show hosts asked me if polygamy is better than monogamy. You could have monogamy because you're very attractive. I'm sure you would have been with many men and had children. Why is it more attractive to you, King asked. That's such a weird question. That's exactly the point I said. I am a 38-year-old woman who chooses to live this way, and I should be able to if I want to. This lifestyle has been going on for centuries. Stephanie, author of Marriage, A History, is among researchers who note that plural marriage is found in more places at more times than any other. Matter of form in the world, page 10, according to the 1998 atlas of 1,231 documented societies, 186 were monogamous, 453 had occasional polygamy, which was a man with multiple wives, 588 had frequent polygamy, and four were polyandrous. 
a woman with multiple husbands. C. Patrick Gray, a corrected ethnograph atlas, world centuries number 10. Okay, that's just a footnote. Let me get back to where I was. It didn't just start up recently with Mormon Church. And there are challenges. I think there are challenges and in struggles in marriage relationship. That was a weird sentence, but that's what I think there are challenges in and struggles in any marriage relationship. Okay, it wasn't weird. It was just me. <laughs> but you prefer it, right, King Prodded? I certainly prefer it, I told him. But it was Troy Roberts on the TV show 48 Hours who asked me the question that stumps many people I've met. How does sharing your husband with other women enhance your spiritual lives, Roberts asked. We learn a lot of things about ourselves. We learn about our emotions, I said. Can you see living your life any other way, he asked. I can hardly imagine it, I told him. The point is, I don't feel I have less love or joy in my life because Joe has relationships with Alina and Vicky. In fact, I have more. That is kind of hard to believe, but I guess she's saying she has more because not only is she receiving love from Joe, but she's see receiving a platonic love from her sister wives as well. As I told Oprah, in this day and age of alternative lifestyles, I should be able to make this choice just as other adults, such as homosexuals and polyamorous, are able to structure their personal relationships however they choose. Altogether, Joe, Alina, Vicky, and I have nearly 100 siblings. Some of them knew they would pursue plural marriage from childhood. Others sought it out later in life. We have siblings who believe in plural marriage but have never had the opportunity to live it and some who entered plural marriages that for one reason or another just didn't work out. We also have siblings who as adults never follow the fundamentalist faith. Joe, for example, is the only one of his father's 17 children who is in a plural marriage. Wow. The fact that there are 17 children and out of all of them, he's the only one that is a part of plural marriage is perplexing to me. I want to know more. Why? Did they see something that they did not like? Was Joe's father not as uh, loving and as hands on as Joe is? Because we know that Joe has said that he tried not to mirror some of the things that his father mirrored. So is that part of the reason why some of his other siblings did not choose this faith? This is a typical pattern among the fundamentalists we know. Not every person raised this way decides to adopt the lifestyle. Our family is typical in another way too. Mega families in which a man such as Winston Blackmore of Canada or FLDS leader Warren Jeffs has dozens of wives are an anomaly. Most plural families we know consist of a husband and two or three wives. Plural marriage is only one aspect of our faith and it's not the only acceptable form of marriage in our culture. It is not essential to get into heaven as many critics of the lifestyle falsely assert. Okay, so here we have, according to their form of the plural marriage, you do not have to necessarily do this in order to get into heaven, which might be one of the reasons why they say that it doesn't matter to them what their children decide in terms of that. Mormon theology holds that there are three different degrees, okay, of glory or levels of heaven that a person can attain in the afterlife with the highest being the celestial degree. Fundamentalist Mormons believe that to reach that level, it's necessary to live celestial marriage. My capacity to love has changed as a result of living the principle, and so has that of my children. I see that every day in many ways. Not long ago, our sons, Caleb and Jed, who have a folk band, put on a concert for family and friends to raise money to produce a music CD. The event became a family affair. Their little sisters helped prepare snacks and cookies for a bake sale. Their brothers built a stage and set up lights and chairs in our big garage. As the concert got underway, we found that the boys had a surprise for us. The warm-up act was our sons, Lewis, Grayson, Tavish, and Logan, who accompanied Jed on a number. The older boys had taught the younger ones a song. Oh, that's cute. Taking time to practice it with them so it was show-worthy. 
Caleb and Jed also arranged for their sisters, Amanda and I think that's Liesl or Liesl, to perform during the concert. As I stood watching our children come together like this, I felt wonderfully gratified to know we'd help them form bonds that will last beyond a lifetime. My tears really flowed when Caleb performed a song he'd written for us moms about growing up in a plural family where there was always love, love, love. That's sweet. I believe what this family says. I feel like with the Browns, a lot of what we got was fake, but with them, I believe this. This is the kind of family moment many people don't connect with, our lifestyle, and yet it is at the heart of it all. And just like Larry King and Oprah, a lot of people are surprised by my appearance, very mainstream, and think I'm an anomaly. Trust me, I'm not. I know and associate with many people in our culture who look and dress and act just like anyone else in society. Sometimes when I meet people, I can tell by their look on their faces that I don't fit their preconceived notion of plural wives as oppressed women who are forced into this lifestyle. It is an inaccurate stereotype that is hard to shake. When Joe and I were on our honeymoon in Hawaii, we met a guy who asked us where we were from. I wonder when they went on their honeymoon, because how did that work with the other uh, wife? Anyways, uh, Salt Lake City, Joe told him. Oh, so you're one of those polygamists, the man said? Yes. I'm the third wife, and this is our honeymoon. Oh, never mind. Okay, this is the third wife. Laughing, he walked away, never suspecting that we had told him the honest truth. The point is, a lot of times people don't know when they are looking at a polygamist in their face. That said, I respect the choice of some fundamentalist Mormons, such as the FLDS, to wear clothing that distinguishes them and reflects a group identity and religiously based modesty. In that regard, they are not unlike the Amish, who also use clothing to reflect their spiritual principles. It's funny that they say that because one of the things um, in my old faith that we were taught is that we're supposed to be peculiar people, which is one of the reasons why they felt like us not having the piercings and wearing the jewelry and the colored nail polish and things of that nature made us stand out. And you do get to a point when you're at Venice where you can look and sometimes by mannerisms or certain things that are said, certain vernacular, um, that you're talking to a fellow Adventist. So I get what they're saying in that. Over the years, I've sometimes faced hostile audiences and interviewers who have spoken as though all polygamous experiences were the same or have claimed that polygamy is inherently abusive and that no woman in this lifestyle is happy. It's just not true. And I don't appreciate blanket assumptions of that sort being made about me or about my family. I want y'all to take a moment because this has me thinking. When you originally heard that I was going to be reading about another polygamous family. How did you all feel? Just think about it. You don't have to necessarily put it in the comments. But how did you feel? Because it's true. Certain words do automatically make people have certain assumptions. And I feel like because of what we may have previously been exposed to with the Browns, that we might have been looking at this family under a, def a different lens if we weren't being open-minded. But because a lot of, of us, us approach this in an open-minded manner, we're receiving it differently. Just a thought, my thought. Sometimes attempts to belittle the way we live are outlandish. In January 2011, Alina testified about her experience as a plural wife in historic court proceedings before the Supreme Court of the British Columbia, which was deciding whether Canada's law against polygamy is constitutional under the country's Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Alina described the free choice she exercised in entertaining plural marriage, how it is a spiritual practice for her and how much love there is in our family. She was asked whether she had the freedom to choose to live with multiple husbands. Alina answered the way any of us would, telling the court she has the freedom to make that choice, but it isn't keeping in with her personal values. As a family, we have come a long way since our first tentative steps into the public spotlight with the Mormon focus. The questions we now 
get run along familiar tracks? Do you get jealous? Are you treated badly? Do you have arranged marriages? What is the doctrine behind it? Do you encourage your children to live this way? Given that polygamy is against the law, why do you still choose to live it? Are you afraid of persecution? Are you afraid of prosecution? You know the answer to many of these questions. My goal is for people to see how human I am, to realize I could be their neighbor and to understand that I deserve as many rights and as much respect as they do. My message is simple. I live this way by choice and I am content and fulfilled by my life. We have mixed reactions from some fundamentalist Mormons about our decision to go public. The old school folks say it won't do any good and we're putting our family in jeopardy. The younger people say it's awesome that we're willing to stand up for what we believe and our right to structure our family as we choose. We get that mixed reaction from our relatives and our children too. We allow our older children to make their own decisions about whether to participate in media interviews. We let our children, even the younger ones, know when one of us is likely to be in the news and try to insulate them as much as possible from the repercussions of our public appearances. I like that they give their kids a choice, um, maybe not the younger ones, but definitely the older ones, on whether or not they participate in these things. I think that that's important. I think that that was one of the things that the Browns were lacking, is that they were able to profit off of their kids being exposed to us and we don't know if the kids necessarily had a choice. But at times, a backlash is inescapable, such as Amanda's experience with her soccer teammate's dad, described in the previous chapter. Our children have had a particularly hard time in those occasions when we've agreed to do an interview and then had our comments subsequently misused, twisted, or demised. The online comments posted with some stories have been hurtful and even scary. We've had friends and business clients shun us. Once a stranger showed up on our doorstep wanting to get to know our family after one of us appeared on a talk show. That's so bold. These experiences have drawn us together as a family to talk about the value of civil rights, free speech, and correct principles. We consider our marriage sacred and very traditional in all aspects. Its foundation rests on five of the six marriage dimensions identified by the Coalition for Marriage, the Institute for American Values and other marriage proponents. There is a financial partnership, a sacred promise, a sexual union, a personal bond and a family making bond. The dimension it lacks is legal recognition. I'm not asking for and don't expect for marriage to receive official state approval, but I believe unique bigamy laws that make polygamy a felon are unfair. Utah's bigamy statute reads, a person is guilty of bigamy when knowing he has a husband or wife or knowing the other person has a husband or wife, the person purports to marry another person or cohabitates with another person. Several states have similar statutes. Massachusetts and New Mexico, for example, explicitly refer to polygamy as a crime. Prosecutors turn a blind eye to other bigamous relationships when a spouse is separated or not yet divorced and lives with a new partner, for instance but threaten and sometimes use the law to go after men who want to acknowledge, honor, and support their multiple port partners through religious bond. That's true. Because they can cheat all they want to and nothing happens to them. But here you have these people who are open about their lifestyle and they risk uh, being prosecuted. Decriminalization, um, decriminalizing polygamy would go a long way towards bringing the practice out of the shadows so families like ours can live openly and honest. That sounds a lot like what the Browns are saying. Interesting. I'm wondering if they got some of their material from them, y'all. I gotta be honest, just because these people seem far more invested in it and they were out there before the Browns. It would also make it more likely that when problems do occur, people who need help can seek it without fear that their lifestyle will take the focus of real issues. Decriminalization would end my fear about how much I can tell people about myself and my family and what my children can say about their parents, their brothers, and their sisters. Ultimately, I want my children's generation to grow up with pride in their culture and religious heritage. And if they choose this lifestyle without worry that the state might raid their homes and remove their children simply because of the way they put their families together. Joe. 
after Kira's, Kyra's, I hate saying it wrong, y'all, death, I was angry about what my family had been through. Angrier still that our lifestyle had driven the state's suspicion and downright furious that the state now wanted to dictate how I lived. I had a choice, stand up for my faith or cower behind my fear. I picked the first option. I vowed to get to know the people who were using negative assumptions about my lifestyle to bring the power of the state against me. I decided I would put meaning and purpose to my daughter's death by trying to correct misguided notions and stereotypes about our culture. When a relative invited me to give a presentation about my experience to a nonprofit advocacy group called Utah Children, I readily accepted. It was my first time speaking publicly about my lifestyle. That led to an invitation to serve on the Utah Children's Polygamy Study Group subcommittee which was helping service providers reach out to polygamous families. My assignment was to help state workers understand the fundamentalist Mormon man's perspective. My ultimate goal, though, was to change their perspective so no other polygamous family would have to experience what we did when my daughter died. See, this is what I'm talking about. Boots on the ground. I found I liked working behind the scenes with agency directors and caseworkers. For the first time in my life, I introduced myself by saying, hi, I'm Joe and I'm a polygamist, which drew either stunned silence or nervous laughter. I even met with the director of the state's child welfare division and shared my experience with his agency. In addition, with other committee members, I visited editorial boards of several Utah newspapers to urge them to stop painting fundamentalist Mormons with a broad brush. The subcommittee was the precursor to a very different organization, one that I've mentioned earlier, Principal Voices with Advocates for Fundamentalist Mormons. Anne, Mary, Linda, Marina, no, Marion, who were all part of the culture, founded the organization in 2003. Anne also was a driving force behind Mormon Focus, the magazine that featured my wives on its inaugural cover. Principal Voices' twofold mission is to help the public understand our culture and to educate fundamentalists about laws and social services available to them. It has taken an unwavering stand against underage marriage and abuse of any kind and advocates for the decriminalization of the bigamy law that make polygamy a felony. Principal Voices also took the lead in organizing the Polygamy Action Committee, an unprecedented gathering of the major fundamentalist Mormon groups, except the FLDS. They not trying to include them, I get it. Because of the doctrinal and leadership differences, the various factions had had little interaction, in some cases, a divide that extended back decades. The fundamentalist Mormon movement is so big and diverse, so mistrustful of government and sometimes each other that it's difficult to get everyone under the same tent. It was a real feat to bring people together to discuss common concerns and ways we might join forces to promote understanding of our culture and defend our rights despite our differences. The committee, which continues to meet monthly, is now known as the Principal Rights Coalition, and I have presided as its chairman since the end of 2007. In recent years, we sponsor educational seminars, given public presentations, taken an active lobby role when appropriate, and engaged in service projects, public awareness rallies, and charity fundraisers. In 2010, for example, the coalition organized a talent show and raised $1,800 for Utah's domestic violence hotline. That's beautiful. That is beautiful. I can appreciate their efforts. The coalition also is helping government agencies understand the barriers our criminal statutes create, how it pushes us underground and into difficult decisions, and why decriminalization would benefit the government and fundamentalist Mormons who practice polygamy. So, Cody them like to take a lot of credit for why this was decriminalized, but I feel like it's efforts like this Things like what his organization, the organization that he's a part of is doing that helped it to get to that process. Here's an example from my own life with most of our children. I was able to list myself as the father on their birth certificate applications. Changes to Utah's law now require an unmarried father to file paternity declaration before he can be listed on a birth certificate. 
I can assure you that I am not the only polygamist who has concerns about filing such paperwork with the government. Oh, wow. As a result, my name is not listed on my daughter Tori's birth certificate. Years ago, Utah children wanted to make sure polygamous families had access to services designed to protect the health and well-being of the children, such as the food stamp and low-income health insurance programs. I pointed out the difficulty plural families had trusting that the information they disclosed would not be shared with law enforcement agencies. I also pointed out the challenges plural families have filling out aid applications completely honestly. For example, is it fraud to apply under the status single mother, given that the state does not recognize polygamous unions? When listing members of one household, is the entire plural family counted? Does it make a difference if the plural family lives in one home or in separate residences? By the way, plural wives who are not legally married to their husbands may apply as single mothers for food stamp and government-funded children health insurance programs, provided they are fully disclosed. They fully disclose household income, including any support they receive from their children's father. Those programs are available to assist children from fundamentalist families, just as they are of unmarried moms or impoverished families in every state. But the point is, from health insurance applications to tax returns, fundamentalist Mormons are often relegated to none of the above choices. I never, ever thought about that. I never thought about that. That is true. I never thought about how they would have to file taxes. I wonder how they do file taxes. Does everybody consider it a household? That's different. There are all sorts of calculations that I run through when someone asks me about my wife or children. The question I hate most is how many children do you have? The minute I answer truthfully and say 24, I've given myself away. So I do a quick assess I do a quick assessment. What does this person already know about my family? And which other family members might he or she know? Our answers have to match up after all. When a dentist recently asked me how many children I had, I decided that since Alina also had an appointment with him, I would give him the answer that fit her. Seven, my words are always chosen carefully in that case. My wife and Alina and I do have seven children. The principal, that's, uh, I get what he's saying, but that's kind of shaky because you know what he means, but I get it. I can't, I'm going to be quiet because I can't say what I would say in that case, especially if I was worried that I, I could get detained because of that. The Principal Rights Coalition has accomplished much over the past decade, successfully making our voices heard in legislative debates that directly and indirectly affect us, such as bills or on midwifery, marriage, homeschooling, and parents' rights to shape the religious education of their children. And individually a growing and individually, a growing number of fundamentalist Mormons are also speaking up in defense of the lifestyle and their children's civil rights. Two fathers, one in Utah and one who formerly lived in Pennsylvania, have successfully waged court battles when a divorce threatened to cut them off from associating with their children because of their fundamentalist views and belief in polygamy. Cody Brown and his four wives also have stepped forward to showcase that polygamous lifestyle in a reality show on TLC, a cable television network, but there are consequences to going public as the Browns found. A county prosecutor launched an investigation into the family on possible bigamy charges after the first episode of the show aired in 2010. One wife lost her job and Cody, an advertising salesman, was he really that? <laughs> And he's lied. To, he's lied about so many things. Was he really an advertising salesman? Um, noted that his business suffered as well under financial and legal pressure. The family was forced to move from Utah to Nevada. I feel like that's what he got from them. That's what we were told, but I still don't buy it. We undertook this book knowing we might face similar repercussions. So there is more to do, particularly in regard to the laws targeting polygamy. As numerous legal experts have pointed out, the reasoning in 1879 U.S. Supreme Court decision in Reynolds versus United States, which upholds bigamy statutes that target polygamy, is racist, outdated, and unfounded given today's mores. But... The decision stands. Utah and Arizona authorities have to date not been willing to take on the kind of case most likely to trigger a review. 
one involving cons consenting adults like us who have committed no other crimes and whose religious beliefs are at the heart of our plural marriage. Legal experts see a precedent for what might happen where such a case is to be put forth in the high courts in 2003 ruling in Lawrence versus Texas. The case involved two homosexual men charged with sodomy. The sodomy laws, the court noted, were aimed at controlling a person's relationship that, while not recognized by law, is within the liberty of the person to choose without being punished as criminals. In its ruling, the court found that the 14th Amendment protects liberty rights that involve the most intimate and personal choices a person may make in lifetime. The court said Texas sodomy laws touch on the most private human conduct, sexual behaviors, and in the most private of places, the home. The Lawrence decision also held that a law brands one class of persons as criminals solely based on the statute's moral disapproval of that class and the conduct associated with that class runs contrary to the values of the Constitution and the Equal Protection Clause under any standard of review. Oh, Lord, this is really case heavy. That's the effect bigamy laws have on consenting adult polygamists like me. We are branded as criminals and subjected to discrimination. The truth is the fallibility of human nature that leads to terrible abuse can be found in every culture and segment of society, including my own culture and other extended families. That's true. But there are adequate laws to root out those problems without trampling on civil liberties. Part of the mission of Principal Voices is to ensure that resources are available when plural families need help and that problems are addressed in a healthy, proactive manner. Critics often claim that polygamy is inherently abusive. A more true statement would be to say that monogamy inherently breeds abuse. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. <laughs> One example in 2010 alone, seven women in my home state of Utah who were in monogamous dating, cohabitating, or married relationships were killed in their intimate partners, by their intimate partners. Okay, I see where he's going. In more than one year, in more than 170 years of Mormon polygamy, I am unaware of any woman murdered by her husband. I am speaking here only about polygamy among early Mormons and current fundamentalist Mormons. I, I mean, if y'all are in hiding, can you really know? I'm just saying that might not be accurate. Far more children are sexually and physically abused and even killed by boyfriends and fathers who are in monogamous dating, cohabitating, and married relationships with their mothers. Likewise, across the United States, tens of thousands of adolescents run away from their homes or are permanently abandoned by their parents each year, yet it is often a media event when a child leaves a polygamous family. Yet there have been terrible events involving one group of fundamentalists in recent years. I am horrified by the allegations that the FLDS Warren Jeffs manipulated numerous families into handing over their underage daughters, some as young as 12, to be spiritually married and then sexually abused by him. The fact that he's calling that um, an allegation is interesting. I guess he's trying to be safe. We know it to be true. In my opinion, he has taken advantage of his followers' fear of the government and of persecution to shield his actions. That's true. The criminalization would decrease the likelihood that someone like Jeffs could use the law as a tool to keep people silent and compliant. Utah was required to add language to its state constitution adopted in 1895, banning polygamy as condition of statehood. Arizona's constitution contains a similar ban. In 1935, the Utah legislator increased the criminal statutes of bigamy from a misdemeanor to a third degree felony punishable by up to five years in prison, which led to some of our ancestors' lengthy imprisonments in crowbar college as my grandpa dave used to call it okay y'all i gotta be real all this court 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 it's boring me but we're almost done like joe you're killing us with this court stuff he was sent to prison in the mid 1940s along with my old my other grandfather albert e barlow and some of my wife's forebears 
in Utah, the bigamy law is rarely enforced. In fact, the state attorney general has said, given current limited resources, he will go after only polygamists who have committed other crimes, such as child abuse, to which bigamy charges are often added. Like the founders of Principal Voices, I want to see bigamy return to its misdemeanor status and the law changed to read as follows. A person is guilty of bigamy when he or she is civilly married and undertakes to secure a second or additional civil marriage. That articulates the fraud against the state that was originally the intent of bigamy laws. Like most fundamentalist Mormons, polygamous men, I have remained largely and sometimes literally in the shadows because of very real fear of economic repercussions and being prosecuted for bigamy. I'm not seeking state sanction for my marriages, but I should not be at risk of criminal prosecution when the religious motiv motivated way I have structured my family is paralleled by commonplace secular lifestyle choice. Hef, Hugh Hefner's lifestyle is celebrated in popular culture and featured on television shows. But how is his living with three girlfriends at a time more acceptable than our choice in building a family now? Don't get me started on Hugh Hefner because there was a lot more going on than that. The current bigamy laws are not stopping the religiously based practice of polygamy. All they do, as evident from the past, is force believers underground into isolation and secretive behavior. Such laws will continue to make abusive behavior when it does occur more difficult to detect and give cover to men and group leaders who are unscrupulous. The debate about polygamy often overlooks personal choice and constitutional liberty rights. I want the right to structure my family and my personal relationships with other consenting adults as I see fit. I want tolerance for unions like mine entered into freely and willingly by consenting adults who are motivated by religious belief and whose conduct cannot be shown to pose any substantial harm to the state or those under persecution. Oh, or those under its protection. I go adding words. We are nothing more than a family, one that experiences the same challenges, but also the same joys as many other family. For me, that's watching my children make a circle of a giant pumpkins in front of the yard and use them as seats for a game of Duck Duck Goose. It's helping put on a Sunday brunch for a father-in-law's 17th birthday, a gathering that brought out close to 100 relatives. And it's what happened just last summer. We pulled a hose across the back lawn, dividing the grassy area into slides for a crazy game of dodgeball. Vicky was on one side and I was on the other and all my children were divided up between us. As seven dodgeballs flew back and forth, so did the laughs. Up on the deck, Val visited with her parents. Across the lawn, Alina prepped hamburgers, patties for the grill. I couldn't stop grinning as I looked around and I saw each of my wives had the same smile on her face. This is just the way we always hoped our lives would be. This is where it all comes home for me, my family. I am so proud of the courage and character my wives and some of my children have shown in speaking up for the right to live the way they choose despite the strong opposition determined to silence our voices. Like them, I am no longer willing to let our family and our beliefs be defined and defiled by detra oh, detractors, the uninformed, and those who fled unhappy plural marriages and broken families. I hope telling our story increases public understanding of our lifestyle so that our children, whether they choose to follow our example or not, will be spared the prejudices, misconceptions, and fears we have endured. This is, after all, a country founded on religious freedom, a country that proclaims respect for personal choice when it comes to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Y'all, that is technically the end, and I'm going to stop here. There's like a brief overview of fundamentalist Mormon stuff that I may read. It's probably going to have a few things in there that I don't really think. Well, you know, let me see. No, this is this is basically kind of what we already went over. Maybe I'll include it as just a little snippet separately. But that is the end of the book. So in a few days, we'll be starting on our next book. You all tell me what you guys thought of this book overall. Let's do a comparison. 
Which book did we like more? If you listen to both. Now, if you didn't listen to both, you can't vote. <laughs> Which one did we like more? This book, uh, Love Times Three, or uh, the Browns book, Becoming Sister Wives. Thank you all so much for your time. Please ring that doorbell. Ding, ding, ding dong. I mean, every time I do the bell, it's going to be different. <laughs> Thumbs up the video for me. It helps. Uh, leave a comment down below. You can even just say, hey, it all helps my algorithm. Um, also, if you have not done so already, please subscribe. And until next time.